yet another episode of It's Me Speaking to You. I am, as always, your host, Mr. Jeffrey Wilson, coming to you live and direct from the gateway to the West, St. Louis, Missouri. And today, folks, we have on a very, very talented filmmaker who I've become a huge fan of lately. Not even just filmmaker, historian, filmmaker, documentary filmmaker. Um... I wound up, this gentleman gentleman popped on my radar a few years ago, completely accidentally. I was talking to a neighbor in my backyard as we barbecued, sipping some beers. He was talking about a show he had just seen, and he was fascinated by a gentleman he had seen depicted in the show. The gentleman's name was Maserati Rick. And so we start talking about this, and I'm always a big organized kind of crime, gangland kind of, kind of, uh, kind of fan, and that's the show he was watching, Gangland. Well, they talked about not only Maserati Rick, this gentleman Maserati Rick, but this whole cast of characters. This essentially this organized crime organization which existed in Detroit, um, not only during Maserati Rick's time, because it goes back quite a ways. And this gentleman, our guest today, has chronicled a great deal of that very succinctly and very accurately in uh, in, a, in a very entertaining fashion. It's very informative. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the director of several documentary films, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, he's teasing and uh, got a, has a GoFundMe uh, set up for his uh, most recent film. He's... Uh, going after which is called police state and their most recent one before that was called Kill killing jimmy hoffa which we're going to get into all of that ladies and gentlemen i know that was a little long-winded but please welcome to the program straight from the d detroit michigan ladies and gentlemen mr al prophet how you doing sir Oh, thank you that's quite an introduction i should hire you as my pr person thank you. <laughs> yeah man i've been a fan man i've been a fan you um and to say you didn't necessarily do the original thing I saw on Gangland, but through that research, it did take me to uh, some other films that you have produced and been a part of dealing with that very same subject. Um, why don't you tell me and tell us a little bit before we get too deep into this particular subject matter, um, how did you get into filmmaking? You're really good at it, and obviously you have a, a hankering for history. How did you get yourself into this, uh, this field of work? Well, from the time I was a kid, I wanted to uh, possibly be a director, but going to college, uh, didn't want to major in film. That seemed kind of ridiculous to me for some reason. So I got a master's degree in economics, actually, and while I was um, finishing that up, I started, I decided instead of paying to go to film school, I would make people pay me to learn how to become a filmmaker, and I started doing some uh music video, rap videos for rappers in Detroit, like low budget, a couple hundred bucks, and then that kind of grew, and I got kind of uh, had a run of being the go-to guy for the uh, the uh, Detroit rap community of doing videos for them, and kind of, then I, when I got tired of that, then I decided, okay, well, how can I make a film without having, you know, a million dollars to make, you know, a, a, a movie? And I said, well, let me do documentaries. What, what are my, where do my interests lie? What, what can I do that would be interesting and important and who do I have access to? And I said, well, Detroit crime. And at the time, I had just completed my master's and I was working at uh, Wayne State University, which is a huge, excuse me, university, right? in downtown Detroit, and I was doing a lot of data analysis involving demographics of the city, but also for the police department, we were getting all kind of crime data. So between me growing up in inner city Detroit, me having, knowing the history, and then also having, uh, seeing this data that nobody else was seeing, and then through personal contacts of people that I knew whose family members had been you know, once upon a time involved in some of these major criminal activities, I said, well, let me let me do one about that, and it was called Murder City, 100 Years of Crime in Detroit, and we kind of chronicled going from all the infamous um, um, groups that the city of Detroit has created crime-wise from the uh, Purple Gang, which is the only uh, totally Jewish organized crime group that ever existed, and they were one of the deadliest organized crime groups of the 1920s and 30s. Uh, they kept Al Capone out of Detroit. They participated in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago, and then we moved on into the riots and the rise of the, the, the black uh, heroin kingpin. You're talking and about the 67 riots, correct? Correct, which, you know, those occurred all around the, you know, St. Louis had one, 
Watts, and obviously sure. uh, the Detroit riot of 19... But what, so anyway, so in doing all this Detroit stuff, it just, I, I found Detroit to be, I mean, I happen to be from here, but when you're talking about the social ills of America, Detroit doesn't have any that everywhere else doesn't have, but it's slightly worse here for some reason. So, sure. and in, I was shocked to find out, you know, and, and you hear about... Um, in the gangster era that you think of Chicago as being the, the murder capital. Well, of all the northern cities, actually, Detroit was by far the most violent. It was much more violent than Chicago. And then as you get into the, 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 the 1943 um, race riot in Detroit, which we talked about in Murder City, was one of America's few actual race riots where black and white people were attacking and killing each other. And that was the deadliest riot in the 20th century until the 1967 Detroit riot, which then became the deadliest riot in the 20th century until the L.A. riot. But if you read the, uh, this is kind of an aside, this is a uh, nerdy, uh, I guess, uh, crime nerd info, but I guess it's important. I was reading through the list of all the victims of the Los Angeles riot, which was supposedly like 50-some people, mm -hmm. and there was a political motivation to make the, the Los Angeles riot seem, it was very horrible, but seem as bad as it, worse than it even was. And if, for example, there was a guy listed as a victim in the Los Angeles riot that several days after the, the fires had ended and all that, he got in his car to go to the grocery store. The grocery store he normally went to had been burned down in the riot, so he went to a different grocery store, and somehow he got into a verbal altercation with the produce manager at the other store who killed him, and that was listed as a riot casualty, Statistic. and there was a lot of story stories to get Los Angeles. So, so anyway, so then I just got into doing as, as you do one thing, and that Murder City documentary was really successful. So I got a lot of contacts mm -hmm. out of that, and then I was able to continue to do more. And um, once law enforcement and people in the street saw that I really would do my homework, and I and I placed all these stories in the social context, um, you know, it just became easier for me to do more and more uh, projects. Well, yeah, and you, and you definitely, I mean, everyone, go check out, and we'll get into his social networking stuff at the end, but go check out what he's done, his work. He is very, very, very thoroughly researched, and you're absolutely right, man. The D was doing things and has been doing things on a very different level, even in some of your movies, man, uh, DEA, you know, really veteran John Sutton said, you know, he had been all over the country dealing, you know, in some of these, you know, un doing the world, all, all over the world, all over, all over the, the world. world. Yeah. And he said he said himself, man, John Sutton from the DEA said the D was in Detroit was absolutely the worst that he had seen. So it was the only time I was frightened working undercover. And this thing for those of, well, who would know John Sutton is John Sutton has. If you want to go on Kindle, he has a great book called White Lines that he wrote about his experience as an undercover DEA agent. But he was, I think he was the first black undercover DEA agent. And he was sent to Detroit in 1972, and he worked cases in Mexico, South America, you know, Baltimore, St. Louis, New York, all around the country. And he had some really... <laughs> really uh, crazy experiences here in Detroit. His his informant that he was initially set up to work with was soon after. Oh well, the the tar his initial target again, Devil Jackson. The day that he arrived in Detroit, uh, the, the local Detroit police uh, told him, "Well, Devil Jackson got shotgun in the face last night, so your initial target is dead." But and then they introduced him to his chief informant. His chief informant was soon found dead uh, in a field, having been eaten by field rats. And Sutton had to kind of make his way uh, on his own in the mean streets of Detroit doing his undercover work. Yeah, and that body had to be identified from a very, very partial print, which wasn't eaten by the field rats, if I remember from the from the movie there. Um, no. Yeah, no. And, it's, as you, and like you said, as you start with some of this, when you pull the thread, there, it just it just starts unraveling so many different levels and layers. And you're like you said, dating back all the way to the to like the said the purple gang. 
And like I said in the kind of the pre-interview, there's so many different names and so many different relevant players in all of this dating back from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and upwards. Um, I want to try to um, at least touch on a few of them. Um, moving up through the 40s and 50s, a very um, key individual, I believe his name was Henry Marzette. He was a, a young cop that came right out of the academy and would start doing undercover bust and then kind of got caught up and kind of flip size. Um, he was, I wouldn't say he was the start, but, you know, dating from like the 50s up, he really was the start of, uh, of one of the bigger wigs, if you will, who was starting to, uh, to slang in the D. Is that, uh, is that true? Tell us about Henry Marzette. Well, Henry Marzette is a fascinating character. He was a, a black Detroit police officer in the 1950s, and in 1959, I think he was convicted of some form of corruption. So when he was in prison, he started to work with, with the Italians, and when he got out, he became the key, one of the key receivers um, for Italian, uh, for mafia heroin in Detroit. And, uh, you know, Henry Marzette, um, um, you know, kind of his crew was, you know, they were doing extortion, murder for hire, kidnapping, uh, really, really rough bunch. And he had the big name on the streets, um, but as kind of a, these stories are also complex, just two things to mention in relation to Henry Marzette. The Detroit... Um, was always, along with New York, the uh, largest importation point of heroin for the mafia in the 1940s, 50s, because um, a guy named Battle Mente in Sicily, who was controlling all the heroin coming out of Sicily, he had family in Monroe, Michigan, which is just south of Detroit, and there were several um, guys here in Detroit that were receiving heroin directly from Sicily. They even had a... Um, and this ties into my Killing Jimmy Hoffa documentary, a, a Teamsters local was basically created just for these two guys to have a cover for moving heroin around the country, and I suspect they were probably feeding Marzette and some other, some other black dealers, and there was another guy from Detroit named John Classen who had become uh, a huge dealer, and I think it's hard to figure out was, was he supplying Marzette or was Marzette supplying him. Mm -hmm. I think what was interesting at that, at that, what's so interesting about the late 60s and early 70s, so as you have with the civil rights movement, you know, black people want their rights and they want to own businesses and this and that, and that all happened in the criminal world too. So you, and with the Vietnam War going on, you started to have black dealers, and I think Henry Marzette was one, who would leave their town, St. Louis or Detroit or whatever, and they would go to Thailand or somewhere themselves, such as like is portrayed in American Gangster and not mm -hmm. the most realistic way, but so there were other people doing that. So there was this this tinderbox of activity going on and um it kind of culminated in uh one of America's early deadliest, biggest drug wars that really presaged what went on later in the, you know, eighties and nineties with the with the Coke crack wars. Um in in, in the early seventies Henry Marzette wanted to consolidate um, all the black dealers in Detroit and cut out the Italians because Marzette had at this point made some kind of overseas connection of his own. And he called a meeting of two sets of people. It's called the West Side Seven, who was down with Marzette, and then there was the East Side Twelve, who were all working for the Italians. And he called a meeting at the Twee Grand Motel, which or hotel, which was um, owned by. Uh, one of the wealthiest black men in America, a guy named Eddie Wingate, who was a uh, big numbers runner. And uh, so Marzette calls this meeting, and he has these Detroit's 20 biggest heroin dealers there. And he says, you know, I got the connection. We don't need the Italians anymore. And, you know, some people went with him, and some people didn't. And there was uh, 200, 200 people killed in the space of about two years. Um um, about that war, and Detroit's uh, largest mass murder actually occurred as part of that, where eight people were killed um, in, a, in a drug house, and it was uh, one of, Mar it's suspected that Marzette had it done, ordered it, and uh, that was never solved. 
Okay, so you, and this is something I've always, uh, as I'm watching all of your stuff, it's so much information to digest, and something I've never always been clear on is the timeline of everything. I have a general timeline. So Marzette was in operation from the 50s up until the 70s? Probably in, well, he went to prison in 59 for being a dirty cop, so he probably ruled the streets from, yeah, 60 till you know, then other people started hitting the scene in the late 60s, and he, all this, this drug war happened, like, from 70 to 72, and Marzette, Marzette actually was one of the, he died young, uh, well, you know, he was like 50 years old, relatively young, yeah. he was one of the first people in the country to have a home dialysis kidney machine, because his kidneys went bad, so that's how, how wealthy he was, he was one of the first people in America to have a dialysis, dialysis machine at his own home, so he was on dialysis, and, uh, he he ended I guess on his on his deathbed. I don't know if he was thinking about the afterlife or whatever, but he kind of ended the drug war by setting up his own chief hitman, a guy named uh, uh, Moody, who was this fearsome guy who killed you know dozens of people. It was Marzette's chief hitman, and Marzette set him up to get killed, and that kind of ended things, and then Marzette died of kidney failure in 1972. Oh, wow. So he had it. Yeah, yeah. I remember hearing that. Yeah, so he had that. I guess probably that was a long a run. way of uh, of making amends. Um, okay, so moving in, moving out of the 70s, mid-70s there, um, we're, we move into another era, and help me out if I'm messing up the timeline, and let me know if uh, how, how much I'm off here. There's another gentleman who comes on the scene. Um, his name is Butch Jones. Um, and he winds up starting a group uh, comes to, comes to be known as YBI Young Boys Incorporated. Um, I'm not sure. Let me know what what exactly year did he come on the scene? So Bush Jones is probably Detroit's most well known uh, to the general public uh, gangster criminal of any kind. Um, but he, in between that kind of time, there was some some other things going on. So you had yeah. I did another documentary called Motown Mafia. I don't know if you saw. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah Eddie Jackson, are, absolutely. Eddie Jackson, yeah. Courtney so Brown. so they kind of they kind of inherited. Well, they didn't inherit, but I mean they kind of as Martin when Marzette they were in the street at the same time Marzette was. By the time Marzette died and that whole heroin war thing was dying out, they had become the biggest dealers, and they were a little less involved in violence and they they, they were the had a gentleman huge, gangster, huge. as he was called. Eddie Jackson was yeah, the gentleman. Now, now, now I'm sure there's some dead bodies associated oh, with him. You know, there but like to you be, said, but, the lore is he would they their crew was less inclined to violence than your chambers, your YBI, your best friend. Right. And there so there so the Jackson and Brown families are living out in what was at the time one of America's premier suburbs. Southfield, Michigan, the other people in the subdivision are, you know, uh, Smokey Robinson, yeah. uh, people like that. Um, the mall, Northland Mall, which served that, that neighborhood, had was the largest furrier in the United States all up through the late 1980s. I mean, that's how much money and wealth was, was in that area. So um, going through the 70s, you have a continuation, and I talk about in the my French connection mini back I just put up on YouTube kind of what was going on with the heroin supply in the mid seventies. It kind of went down when we pulled out of Vietnam because CIA uh, assets in Vietnam were helping flood the streets with drugs, but that's another story. So, so we transitioned through this into the late seventies. It's still the heroin era, and you have this kind of secret society of people like Eddie Jackson and Courtney Brown, Sylvester Murray, and some other people, a guy named uh, Reginald Davis, who, when the DEA composed their first list, where they made a list of top ten uh, international drug violators, there was only one African American on the list, and it was Reginald Davis. He was bringing in heroin directly from you know, Bangkok, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so what Butch Jones is uh, genius, if you want to call it that, I mean, he kind of was the ultimate, he was, he was really a pimp almost in a way, where he was a bully and he, and he gets out of prison in the late 70s after killing somebody in a robbery. 
and he gets with his with these from Dexter Avenue um, near West Side of Detroit, and some of the guys he knows are already doing a little something with heroin, and. Yeah, no, okay, so these stories can just go on and on. So, <laughs> him and right. this guy named Mark Marshall start YBI with uh, $80,000 insurance policy that Mark Marshall received when his father was killed. But the circumstances of Mark Marshall's father's being killed was that Mark Marshall's father had married a woman that was the heiress, she was like the daughter or granddaughter of, I forget what it was called, but it's like Michigan National Trust or something. It was like one of the first black banks in a, in the country or one of the biggest or something. So he had married into this rich family. So Mark Mark, so the father, this woman he married, their nurse and the dog were all killed in the house and covered in, in semen that matched Mark Marshall's semen, but he went on trial twice for killing his father and stepmother, and there were two mistrials, and he ended up, they didn't try him, and he got this settlement, and him and Butch used that capital influx, and they went and saw some of the old-time guys from the Eddie Jackson and the Marzette era, like a guy named Milwaukee Jack, uh, Reginald Davis, like I just mentioned, and they... You know, they, they, they got a package of heroin in YBI, and uh, Butch Jones' is genius was that he, like I said, he was kind of a pimp. He was able to take all these young guys, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, and turn them into this team of, of, of a drug-dealing machine that just kind of took over uh, several of the city's biggest public housing projects, controlled whole neighborhoods, and ran, you know, like, like clockwork. I mean, uh, Is it true I, that I, the basis, uh, I forget what the name of their big building was that took the cop months and months to get in there, that that was kind of the basis for uh, the New Jack City and the Carter and the taking over that big building? Is, that, is there any accuracy to that? Well... Oh. They, in, 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 in my documentary role, and one of the guys I interviewed actually worked in this building in like 1980 when they were talking about making $70,000 a day back in 1980. And he said, we were the Carter before New Jack City. But it is, I don't, it is true that the Carter in New Jack City is directly based on something in Detroit. If you fast forward to 1986, uh, New York journalist Barry Michael Cooper, who uh, he's the screenwriter of uh, New Jack City, which the Carter's from, and some other movies. He wrote an article for the Village Voice in New York called "New Jack City: Detroit Detroit Kills and Eats Its Young." And he come, and he comes to he came to Detroit and saw what was going on with just a, a vast amount of drug activity and money. And the Chambers gang at the time, one of the Chambers brothers, had this building. In Detroit, there was, they called it Marlowe, his nickname was Marlowe, Marlowe's One Stop, where it's $3 rocks on the first floor, $5 rocks on the second floor, $8 rocks, $20 rocks. So the Chamber um, Brothers women's. are operating, I was going to ask you about these guys, so the Chamber Brothers are operating at the same time that, that Butch is starting to get going? No, Butch gets going about 79 and goes away in about 84, 83 and that's right when the cocaine era really crack hit the streets hard in 84. So by the time eight crack hits the streets, Butch Jones is in federal prison. And then you have these, you know, this kind of changeover where... Um, so what happens to the you know, YBI around that time? Because I remember seeing a picture in Roland of my man B. Skeeter. Uh He was uh, with well, in 1988, uh, he's still... Uh, he's, oh, yeah. That's the most amazing chain I've ever seen. No rapper had everything. And for you know those who haven't seen the film, I have a picture in there which is from the late '80s, and he has on this big rope chain, and the medallion is about I don't know, it's about a foot by a foot, and it's a map of the United States, and it has diamonds in every city where they sold drugs at. Big, big diamond. And uh, well, so the the the. Well, here, here, now, here's what's interesting. So, YBI got indicted in 80, late 82. That was before the real draconian drug laws kicked in, which happened in about 86. So, even though YBI was a huge, huge operation, um, the guys, that, I mean, there were people who got life because they got actually caught with large amounts of drugs or murders and all that. But mm -hmm. as far as the RICO indictment, uh, 
Rich, uh, you know, who was the boss of this huge operation, he only, I don't know, he had eight or nine years, a lot of the lieutenants got, you know, 24 months. I mean, so they were back on the street. So they were part of the, a lot of those same guys were, you know, the got then involved in the crack business, the mm. cocaine business. And it's, by this time, the YBI has kind of fizzled out? No, there was a second. So in 87, there was a second YBI indictment, and a bunch of the guys were indicted in prison for continuing to guide operations out on the street. So there was a, YB, there was a second YBI indictment, which included police officers and blah, blah, blah. So YBI was a ghost that haunted the street, haunts the streets of Detroit right now. I mean, there's, the, the, there's still a... Of, of 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 the few guys that still can you know make some serious things happen. I mean, some of them are still people that are left over from the last men standing from from way back then, and they were they were fourteen years old selling dope on the corner for YBI in nineteen eighty, and now they're sixty years old, and they're still. Well, speaking of one of the old heads, man, what, even before some of these guys, uh, dating back, I think, to the, around the Marzette time, or maybe even a little later, a gentleman by the name of Frank Nitty Usher, who was very integral into a lot of this stuff that went down that wound up escaping a life prison, him, uh, prison sentence himself, recently, I forget, within the last few years, 70-plus years old, got caught up uh, with some heroin stuff again. Did you hear about that? Yes. He's, uh, he's out, and... Um and they're where they're working on some kind of deal. It wasn't they, the the news made a big deal out of it because uh, of his name. Is, yeah. I mean, we talked to his lawyer. Um, he they didn't seem too concerned. I mean, either the case will go away or help to some you know right. two years or something. But he you know, they he was he wasn't caught doing any hand to hands or anything. But yeah, he was still still around. I right. mean, uh, so yeah, his for those people who don't know who he is and. In 1979, uh, uh, three beheaded bodies were found in a van in Detroit, and uh, so there ends up being this big, this big murder trial. And uh, Frank Frank Nitty Usher, um, who was who was had become the primary receiver, he was still at that point getting drugs from the Italians. Would think he was one of the few people they would deal with. He got convicted of being involved in this murder. And, um, but he did about uh, nine years or so, or five years or seven years. Well, the, and the defense lawyer, Stephen Fishman, was a master at getting a great many of them folks off on, a, like, some serious charges. Oh, so, well, so he got triple life, and he did about nine years, and then they come back, he gets an appeal, and they turn it into that, they, they say that the killers were there to kill Frank. Two, but he managed to talk them out of it, but they made him help dispose of the body. So mm. then they, this triple, this See, triple murder went away, and it became accessory after the fact of murder, which uh, is just a zero to five sentence. Because uh, I, I was wondering when Stephen Fishman described that and as to why he was, because he was saying how he, he convinced the judge that he was the target, and he said something like through will or force of personality and or move to the side. I'm like, I was just, I was just wondering, how the hell? Oh, it doesn't make, oh, it, 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 it all, I mean, you know, I mean. Uh, I'm just wondering how that played I'll, out, you know. I'll I mean? just, I'll just say this, I mean, uh, you know, Many criminal cases are not decided in the courtroom. They're decided sure. um, with, you know, bags of money and right. well, you're talking certain about judges. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's anywhere. That's, that's, yeah, that's no, probably Detroit at it worse, but 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 uh, but definitely true. So I don't know what happened in that case. I mean, that's a pretty implausible. Unbelievable sounding sure, story, yeah, but yeah, hey, I wasn't there, anything. so how do I know? Who well, knows? Not, not to divert too much, uh, I just wanted that was a little sidebar on, on Frank Usher there. So, so uh, YBI version two goes away, uh, and the other crew that I heard about in this Gangland show was called the Best Friends, and this is around this time, right? This is kind of Butch's enforcement yeah, so team, best, so, the A team, and the well, no, 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 they didn't, no, 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 Best Friends didn't. Oh, best Best Friends were on the, were on the East Side. Oh, okay, okay. So the best friends oh, were them, the, uh, the Brown Brown. There's four, yeah, four Brown the Brown brothers, four brothers, and they're close couple friends. And they start off in the mid '80s when they're 16, 17. Uh, they start getting involved in doing murder for hire. 
So there, and then there's another group called the Monster Crew that was also doing murder for hire on the east side, and they were kind of in conflict. And so, I mean, I read the FBI report, and the best friends described them as the most murderous drug ring in the United States history. I mean, they linked them to like 80 murders, but I mean, the best friends weren't like you know the Crips. Like there was a thousand of them. Right. There was like. 10, 10, 15 of them, you know. Yeah, they were and, uh, I forget which oh, one yeah, they would, who's doing life now. We ran after the dude, ran after the dude. The guy ran into his house, which whatever. Oh, yeah, Rock and Reggie Brown. Yeah, no, they were, they were known for if they were driving down the street and they saw you and they, you had a hit out on you or they were looking for you for personal reasons, they would stop the car, get out and kill you. If they saw you in the mall, they'd kill you in the mall. Yeah. That's true. There was a in the late '80s. There was a big shootout in the Detroit Mall. You could probably look it up. That was involving these guys. Well, there's been there's been several shoot. I mean, it's, it's just as bad now. There's been several shootings right. at that same mall in the last two years. Well, you that, another group. I don't want to, I don't want to keep you too long. We could go off on each of these groups forever, and I, there's some more I want to get to. Um, so the Chambers brothers. Where did these guys fit in? Because they also play a key role. One of them, a gentleman we can talk about, I guess, in this story. Uh, he happened to be a Caucasian gentleman by the name of Rick Worshey who was like 17 years old. He happened to have been dating. Uh, t t tell me about that. Tell me about the Chambers brothers, Rick Worshey, who he was dating and her affiliation to the mayor and political... Oh, well, yeah, they can talk about that forever. So there's, there's a Hollywood movie in the works for that right now. Um, oh, really? Right, re revising the script. It's, it's the same people that did the Whitey Bulger movie. Oh, okay. Um, it's, a, it's a big deal. They've been in town, and blah, blah, blah. Rick Worshey, the um, kid, is doing a life still, by the way. He was 17 and got yeah, caught up so, and still so, doing life. So, Rick, so, 1983, YBI goes down, cocaine is coming in, uh, Joint Federal and Detroit Task, Detroit Police Task Force, you know, okay, who's our, we took down YBI, who's, who's going to be our next, who's our primary target, who are the biggest drug dealers in the city, they target these guys, the Curry brothers on the east side, Johnny Curry was married to the mayor of Detroit's niece at the time, oh, so, so to, to info, there's one of them, I mean, they were tapping their phones and all the normal stuff, but one of the tactics they did to infiltrate the Curry's, and this, my partner Scott Bernstein has validated this with the police and the DEA, this stuff sounds made up, but it's all, this happened, this has been validated. Um, white, this, this, this kid, Richard Worsey, white kid, and he said he tried, was 14 or 13 at the time. His father was a, was a gun dealer, and he had been kind of on the fringes of criminal stuff, and he had had a relationship with the FBI, gave them some info about stuff. So he basically let the police pay him to use his 13-year-old son to infiltrate the Curry boys because they lived, like, on the same block as them. So the police start giving white boy Rick money and having him act like he's selling drugs and he's hanging out. And so he slowly kind of gets into the Curry organization. Johnny Curry becomes suspicious of him. He has another young guy shoot Rick to kill him, but Rick doesn't die. He rake, wakes up in the hospital bed, and the police are standing there, and they say, look, don't say anything. We want you to go back with Johnny Curry like you, and act like you don't know why he shot you. You had your shot. We're going to, and you can find this article in the news because I have. It's a little small article about two teenagers playing with one of their parents' handgun on Detroit's east side. One shot the other, and the homeowner's insurance is going to pay out a $50,000 settlement. So Rick got paid the settlement money for getting shot because the police you know, participated in basically insurance fraud to get him paid and keep him shut up. So he keeps working with them. The Curry brothers get brought down. He Johnny goes Curry's back wife. in there. That's insane. Yeah. So at that, so when he goes back in there, now they're like, oh, shit, well, he can't be the rat. Right, right. So right. he really is in with Johnny Curry. And so finally, the Curry brothers go down, but Rick doesn't stop selling drugs. Rick. They, they they made him a drug dealer, but now he really is one, and he continues, and he's, they made him out to be one of the biggest drug dealers in the city, which he was not, but he was a big drug dealer. I mean, he was dealing in multi-kilos. He wasn't getting 100 kilos, but he was dealing multi-kilos. He's still dating, so he, so now the Johnny Curry's wife, Mayor's niece. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Is he on his yeah. own doing this, or is yeah, he yeah. still working for Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
No, no, no. He's he's, he's on it. The cop said we're done with you. We brought the curries now. Okay. But he he okay. continues on on his own. But also part of the reason he's able to continue is the mayor's niece. Now that her husband's in prison, she the day her husband goes to prison, she calls White Boy Rick up, who's like sixteen or seventeen at the time, and she's like twenty five, and basically says, "I'm your new girlfriend." Takes him to meet the Cuban connection, Johnny Curry's Cuban cocaine connection, and so. Now, Coleman Young, the mayor, has, uh, assigns his part of the security detail, because he knows his niece is dating these drug dealers, to follow his niece around at all times and protect her. But she's with, well, she was with Jen Curry, then she's with White Boy Rick, and they're doing drug deals while this protection squad is outside watching them, who's not, they're just there to protect her in case some bullets break out. They're not there to stop any any, any other kind of crime. So Rick eventually they they they, they catch him with a couple load with a big load of cocaine, he beats the case, then they catch him again and he could have took a three or five year plea deal. He tries to send a bribe to the judge, that gets taken, he goes to trial, he loses, he's been in jail ever since. He's been in jail since 1988, he was 18 years old, mm. for uh, eight kilos of cocaine. Wow, that's heavy. That'd be an interesting movie. Um, that'd be a very, I, I saw, I don't know who did the film King Rat um, on the... Um, oh uh, yeah, Flip Wilson, yeah, he, he was kind of, yeah, it was a little bit all over the place, but... yeah. Um, so that okay, I, I mixed up the Chambers with the Curry. So the Curry, uh, where does the Chambers brothers fit into this timeline? Well, they they were during that same era, and um, they they shared a drug supplier with White Boy Rick. One of the one of the so, and this shows you know the the, the lunacy of the drug law. So you, it's almost like the lower you are on the food chain, the more time you get in prison. There was this guy, white guy named Art Derrick in Detroit who had a jet and was bringing cocaine from Miami. I mean, he was a real drug pink then. And he was supplying Chambers Brothers. And Chambers Brothers were infamous because they actually set up, they were kind of like, they were like the next YBI in the sense that they were, they had the retail outlet. They weren't, it wasn't about, I'm going to get 10 kilos and then put a couple thousand dollar profit on them and sell them to somebody else. They're getting 10 kilos every other day and cutting them into nickel rocks, and they got 100 crack houses around the city. And what years, and, are, these? Um, what years are these for the chambers? They were, they were operative from about 84 to 88, 89. Okay, so there's some overlay on all these kind of operations. A little bit. It's all, all, they're all together. White Boy Rick has a baby, I think, with this white, there's, the white Boy Rick has a baby with a chick, with a girl that, think one of the chambers has a baby with her, too, or they had the same girlfriend at the same time. Yeah, it's all overlapping, Small and it's world. all kind of the same, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, and this, like I said, this is all kind of, uh, the information is quite layered and, and very well researched, as you can hear. You can go check out uh, Roland, uh, and there's, there's other ones, but I think he does the best job. I think Al does the best job kind of breaking it all down. He gets a lot of really good guests um, to really kind of break all this down. And, and a lot of this really kind of, um, it, it, this is such a huge operation. I think people even realize, like some of these guys are making so many, like several million dollars a day. I recently interviewed uh, Freeway, the real Freeway Rick Ross, um, and part Part of his distribution network, uh, actually YBI and some of the stuff in Detroit was a part of his uh, distribution network. So it was, you know, yeah, he really, came through Detroit. Oh yeah, yeah, it was it really, really vast. Um, and, and not to move along too fast, a gentleman that really, um, a, a guy like you said, Frank Lucas gets lamented. You know, American Gangster. Like, I mean, it's not about it's not about how cool you were when you sold drugs. However, he gets lamented as this huge, huge drug dealer, which he really he kind of just held down parts of New York and Harlem. When in fact the real dude who uh, he I think was tied in had to have been tied in governmentally was a gentleman by the name of Frank Matthews. He supplied the country, the world. Like he was he was a big big time dealer. Um, and I'm not even talking about like street level dealer. The guy was like I said was supplying states. Um, and he wound up just after he got indicted, you know, just disappearing. Um, but as uh, like Al said, he he breaks down again very succinctly in his video called "The French Connection," which is on my webpage, which I use to kind of promote Al coming on today. Uh, talks about how he, you know, the the levels of involvement of you know his possible government dealings. Um, talk to me a little bit about Frank Matthews. So Frank Matthews grows up in Durham, South Carolina, uh, North Carolina. 
and he leaves in the mid, I don't know, 64 or something, he's 18 years old, come up to the big city to make his fortune, and somehow, by the late 60s, he's, he's dealing with some very high up uh, Latin gangsters in New York, and I think what I've been able to piece together now, I think that he probably, so, and this ties into the, the JFK assassination and the Bay of Pigs and all that, when Fidel Castro took power, of course, the U.S. government, you know, wanted Fidel out. So Cubans in America, who could help the U.S. government do dirty work, were kind of given get-out-of-jail-free cards. And I think that they were the key connection between um, dealing with the uh, heroin coming in from Southeast Asia or Europe, and they would be the conduit to the black dealers. And I think Frank Matthews was able to, I mean, by the age of 29, I mean, 30 years old, he was um, orchestrating his buys in Venezuela. He was getting... You know, French Connection was bringing in um, um, heroin for him to pick up in in Venezuela and flood the streets of America. He was supplying the biggest dealers in Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, you know, Connecticut, Brooklyn, uh, blah 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 blah. The list goes on. I mean, when I first first started researching uh, Matthews, he almost seemed like a not a real, like a Kaiser Soce, like a made-up, like, Sorry. this couldn't be true, but we, if, you know, if you watch the Frank Matthews documentary, we had the federal prosecutors and, and the agents that worked the case saying, no, Frank controlled the Eastern Seaboard. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, you know, there's stories of, uh, uh, one of the guys tells a story of um, um, Frank one night giving him uh, a bag with like $900,000 and saying, hold this, and forgets to even come get it, and like a month passes, and the guy sees him, and he's like, Frank, when, when are you going to come pick that money up? And Frank's like, what money? The, the million dollars you gave me. And uh, so that, that's... And he's like, he's like are you broke? He's like, then keep it. Then keep the money. Yeah, just keep well, it, yeah. In, in a very, very interesting um, kind of tidbit to this, because this is always kind of how it happens sometimes, these kind of like accidental uh, things which bust cases wide open. Um, one of the things that had him pop up on law enforcement's radar, at least local law enforcement, because I think he was tied in at the top. I think some uh, one of the things that had him pop up on local law enforcement, he was living in the same apartment building as, who was it, the chief of police or some huge lieutenant or somebody high up in the police? Well, no, some, well it, was a, it was a kind of a regular cop who had just gotten promoted. I think, to like me and a sergeant or something, so he had a little more money, and his wife, and his wife's like, well, well, let's move to a nicer apartment building, and they're in this apartment building, and there's like this loudmouth black guy in mink coat, and he's always on the elevator, and he's talking crazy, so the cop starts kind of watching him, and he starts taking pictures of all the license plates that are showing up, and the license plates are all coming back to the biggest drug dealers in, like I said, Baltimore, other parts of New York, Philadelphia, all over the country. And then that's how this case gets opened, and then the feds come in. And um, Frank Manson was actually the target of something called Centac, which is, I don't know if it's been discontinued, but it was used from the early 70s up till. It may still be being used now, but at least up till recently, uh, Central Tactical. It was that was where, at, uh, at the highest federal level, the Department of Justice, they would coordinate local police, DEA, ATF, FBI, CIA, whoever they needed to, to go after the biggest drug targets in the country. And Frank Matthews was Centac number two. The first one was uh, Pleasant Avenue. Uh, Italians in the South Bronx, and and then number two was Frank Matthews. I mean, he was he was the number when he was in the the federal government's crosshairs. He was considered the largest drug dealer in the United States. Yeah, and it's very interesting because you hear, like, again, you hear so many of these other supposedly some prolific, famous, quote unquote, infamous uh, of drug dealers, Frank Lucas, uh, Nicky Barnes, if you will. I, you know, I'm 42 years old, and I, I enjoy all of these kind of stories and hearing about all these. I'd never heard of Frank Lucas or uh, uh, Frank Matthews, and that's not to say I'm, you know, got the pulse on this stuff. But um, again, folks, when you go check this out, and if, I think it's called what's it called, the Frank Matthews? What's the actual name of the movie? story? 
the Frank Matthews Frank story. Frank Matthews story. Yeah, go check it out. It's on YouTube, or you can buy it. It's or it's on YouTube. Um, the Frank Matthews yep. story. You can go check out Roland. Um, we're gonna move into another, move away from some of that. I mean, like I said, there's so many layers to this. We could talk about it forever, and it's very, very fascinating, folks. And like you can hear, Al is as really on point when it comes to this stuff. Um, the next movie and another movie that you recently came out. Like again, as a big history buff and a big JFK guy, it was called the Killing uh, Killing Jimmy Hoffa. Man, that thing was awesome. And, you know, it's always kind of conjecture. Everybody's, you know, he, he's buried under the goalposts of the New York, you know, all these different stories of where Jimmy Hoffa, what happened to him. And you have some very, very good insight. Once again, um, if you can kind of break this flick down and uh, tell folks uh, tell folks a little bit about it. So um, killing Jimmy Hoffa was my most recent one. And that obviously is about Jimmy Hoffa, but he's kind of become a, uh, a punchline of a joke, you know, Jimmy Hoffa's buried under this or that building, but he, in, in studying his life and career, so in the documentary, we don't, we, about the second, I don't know, the last half of it is kind of the, the days leading up to his disappearance and the investigation afterwards, but the first half is about his, his rise from being this, kind of like Frank Matthews, I mean, he was just this little country kid in rural Indiana, and his family comes to Detroit, and he joins the Teamsters, and through just his his, uh, his, his force of will, I mean, he, he, he rises up the Teamster ranks, and this is during the time of American economic expansion through World War II, um, and he becomes the most powerful union leader and the one of the most powerful men, actually, in the United States, and... For those of you who've seen them, I could tell a million Jimmy Hoffa stories, but um, one interesting thing, just so people understand, because you hear Teamsters and Teamster Pension Fund, and what does all that really mean? Well, in the movie Casino, you know how they get the money, they get the loan to buy the to buy the casino, and then at the end, they they when they're doing the hits, they knock off all the financial people back in Chicago. Well, that all really happened, and that was, that's the story of Casino is really the story of the Teamster Pension Fund. It's about how the Teamster Pension Fund, which was the money taking out of Teamsters checks, and for those who don't, I mean, the Teamsters it was the largest union in the United States. There were like 2 million members in the 1960s. So the Teamster Pension Fund was the single biggest pool of money in the United States, I mean, other than the government, right? At billions and billions and billions of dollars back when a billion dollars really meant something. So the whole first wave of the Las Vegas Strip was built off loans from the Teamster Pension Fund, which obviously Jimmy Hoffa had some degree of, of control over. And um, the Teamsters were, again, we go into the Teamster connection with heroin. I talked about early on in the conversation about the two Detroit mafioso who were receiving heroin and from Sicily and were two of the biggest dealers in the country in the 1950s and early 60s. They had their own Teamster local created for them, which I can only imagine was, you know, having access to trucks that you can load up and send around. I mean, it's pretty useful just for distributing drugs. Um, and we talk about Hoffa CIA connections, um, um, you know, there had always been those rumors, and probably a lot of people still think they're rumors, that the CIA uh, tried to work with the mafia to kill Castro. But, in fact, about, I don't know, five or six years ago, the CIA released, and for those interested, you can Google it, they released something called the Family Jewels, where they released a bunch of information about old old operations that actually validated a bunch of these conspiracy theories, one of which was that they, in fact, did in 1960 make contact with Sam Giancana and through Jimmy Hoffa and others and tried to um, see that any of the mafia have contacts still left in Cuba because before Castro took power of the mafia and Meyer Lansky, they had casinos and stuff going on in Cuba, so they wanted to see if the mafia could help them assassinate Castro. Yeah, that's pretty well documented, well, dating back even to, to, the, uh, to the Eisenhower administration. Absolutely. So yeah, and then so that leads that leads uh, like you said, if everyone wants to go see it, it is called Killing uh, Jimmy Hoffa. 
Um, Kill Jimmy Hoffa, and uh, you can go to Amazon Prime. It's free, or you can uh, you can rent it uh, streaming. You can go on my website, alprofit.com. Um, we got a great, great live show, a great streaming thing on there, all the films. So if you can just Google Google any of these films, and there's a variety of ways to watch them. Or even even your name, even uh, Al Prophet, that then you'll definitely all that stuff will come up. Um, and, and I mean, in that movie, it obviously uh, brings up the Kennedy assassination. You can't really bring up Hoffa and the mafia and stuff without bringing up uh, that era, which is you know conspiracy theory of um, obviously you know there's there's so many theories, but um, they do speak about uh, his supposed role in the mafia's role in the assassination of the president. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's the hatred of Bobby Kennedy and Jimmy Hoffa is, is well documented. They had a really bizarre relationship when, um, in in what year would this have been? Uh, Fifty eight or something. He really started their adversary relationship when he was uh, testifying when Hoffa was testifying in front of the McClellan committee. For well, ha- well, well, Hoffa was actually charged with attempted bri- uh, bribery and something else because he he tried to buy some documents from Bobby Kennedy's office from a guy who set him up, and the FBI sat outside and. And, you know, uh, well, it wasn't videotaped, then filmed off of making the payoff, and he was arrested. So he's taken down to the courthouse in D.C. to be arraigned. Bobby Kennedy's there. The two of them, I mean, I, I don't know what this says about kind of guys they were, just the weirdness of the whole thing. They, like, they're arguing with each other. They had a push-up contest in, like, the courthouse, you know, while off is being arraigned. Really? So... So, and I'm always, and I'm always, uh, and here's a little, this is a little story here. I'm, 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 I'm one of the things that's, I'm a history buff. I don't just know history. I shouldn't say buff. I'm very that's knowledgeable right, about history in general. We could, well, I, you know, we could talk about, I know a lot about the, the Roman Empire and ancient China or whatever, but what's interesting about studying crime, it gives you kind of a lens into American society. Sure. And so it's 1959. Hoffa goes on trial. Now, in 1959, there were huge swaths of the country where uh, black people weren't even allowed to vote, right? But this is in Washington, D.C., which was even then mostly black. So Jimmy Hoffa is tried in front of a a black jury, right? And who... And they have Jimmy Hoffa. I mean, they have him on film making the... Like, you know, he's guilt, like, you know. But who should make an appearance and walk into the court and make a big ostentatious show of shaking Jimmy Hoffa's hand and saying, thank you for what you've done for my people, and sitting next to him, Joe Lewis. Oh, wow. The Brown Bomber, so the black jury in Washington, D.C. finds Jimmy Hoffa not guilty. Wow. Wow. That makes sense. Yeah, you know, you know a celebrity? Hell, let's just forget about what you might have done. <laughs> No, what did what did what did the average what did a uh, a black woman in 1959 who was probably working for peanuts as a maid for somebody who was in Congress? What does she care about Bobby Kennedy's office getting bribed? What is what does she care? What, yeah, what's justice to her? That's you know, what's justice? Right. Yeah, so I mean, what's justice? And hey, and if Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters are have given a bunch of good team jobs to 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 black people, I don't care what you did. One man's right do or whatever it is, the whole one man's right. Yeah, one man's right right is another wrong. That's right. That's right. Man, I could honestly, man, we could go on forever, but we're already pushing an hour, and I don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, Again, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Al Prophet. You can go online, go to his website. Um, Shout out your Twitter or any of your social networking stuff, my friend. Uh, at the real Al Prophet is my Twitter, and uh, you can catch me on Facebook, Al Prophet Bradley. And then my YouTube channel, which is really, you can go see all this stuff. It's just YouTube.com slash Al Prophet. There you go. There you go. Well, you, my friend, you have been uh, quite informative, and I'm probably going to just follow up this interview uh, after I get done and watch me some rolling. But I can't let you go unless I have you step in and emerge successfully, my friend, from the conspiracy triangle of doom. It is very simple, my friend. Three very simple questions, which you can answer yes or no, or you can elaborate if you will. If you don't okay. choose. Question number one. Do you, sir, Al Prophet, believe in the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence? I believe in the existence of, of um, 
of life I don't know what the word intelligence like human consciousness no, intelligence no no no, 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 no. Uh, like, and, and it's I mean something I don't know it could be a no, yeah I'm sure that there's oh yeah no no there's life I don't know if the thing is I've been thinking lately I think that being becoming as intelligent as humans are is actually not, uh, not good it's in not an upgrade. evolutionary sense. Right. Yeah, I mean, the dinosaurs ruled the planet for 100 million years. The humans aren't, I mean, we're, we're going to, the odds of destroying ourselves are uh, much greater than zero. Yeah. So I, my personal theory now is why we haven't been in contact with any other uh uh, thinking beings, at least, or conscious beings, is that uh, maybe once you get to be this smart, you don't, uh, you don't last too much longer. Right. Well, Destroy yourself in some way. Very so nice. I do think there's life. There's there's life of some kind. Right. Right. In other places. Yeah, Absolutely. That, that word te- intelligence is a little subjective, but I feel you. Cool, man. Uh, question number two, and I think I might know your answer, but I will ans- ask you anyway. Do you follow the narrative, or do you believe in the official version of events of November twenty second, 1963? Lee Harvey Oswald. Oh, uh, well, there's so many different there's so many different versions of events, but do you I'll, I'll the just official say one. Do you believe the uh, Lee Harvey? The Warren, report? the Warren, the Warren there report? You go. There uh, you go. There you no, go. no. No. I mean, I think, and to go back to the Jimmy Hoffa, just to tie back Jimmy Hoffa real quick, um, for me, there, there's so many people involved in the JFK thing, and it's so, the waters are so muddied, I don't know if it could really be definitively figured out exactly what happened at this point, but the smoking gun to me is that uh, Jack Ruby was definitely tied in with the mafia. Sure it for him to go kill Lee Harvey Oswald well, in the other. basement of the Dallas Police Department is absurd. So it's the smoky gun for me. So, no, I don't believe they, they warned the commission sure. final report. All right, all right. I'm feeling you there, my friend. I'm feeling you there. All right, question number three. Along the same lines of following a narrative, um... Do you believe or do you follow and do you follow the official narrative of the events of 9-11, September the 11th, 2001? Well, it would de- I mean, I don't know what you mean by the, 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 the official. The, the equivalent of the Warren Commission, the 9-11 report, the, you know, Pentagon got hit by a plane. Ninety, you know, uh, hijackers, you know, because of course on the other side you have controlled demolition. You have. I don't think there was a controlled demolition. I think that what I think that that those guys did it, but I think that there was a massive feeling on the part of U.S. intelligence, and just like what police always do, and government officials always do. A lot of these conspiracies, they're not even about that somebody set out to do something evil in the first place. It's that something happened that shows their incompetence or undermines their authority, so then they cover it up. I mean, look at why politicians go to jail half the time. Mm-hmm. Or look at all the, the baseball players in the steroid scandal. They're... They're not, if they, if Roger Clemens just said, yeah, I shot steroids, well, there's no real punishment for that. But when you go under oath in front of Congress and lie and say you didn't, now you committed a different crime. It's the lie. So, yeah, I don't think it was controlled demolition, but I think that there, if you, if you really unraveled, they should have been, he should have been able to stop it. And I think, and actually I'm going to do a mini documentary about Saudi Arabia because I'm interested in Saudi Arabia's role and everything. You know, hmm, Saudi Arabia, our closest Arab ally, because they're the richest Arab country, all the hijackers came from Saudi Arabia. They didn't come from Iraq. Right. So why did we attack Iraq? Well, there's definitely... There's in the money, in, in the money... And the, and the money, the money that supports Islamic terrorism, primarily has been coming from Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Saudi Arabia is run by a very it's hardcore also our ally in the, in the Arab nation. That's right, but yet they're the most they, they're they're not Sunni or Shia. They're they're Wahhabists, which yeah. is a, a very extreme form of Islam, and yet. 
they're our closest ally. The Saudi Arabia is the single largest in the last 40 years. They're the single largest purchaser of armaments from the United States. And the U.S. defense industry makes a lot of people a lot of money. Hmm. Very interesting. Very so interesting. I don't think it was controlled demolition, but I think there's a lot more to the story that would really make us question uh, our loyalty to a lot of the well, and as almost the like people the, the that run a government. It was almost like the Kennedy thing that the the waters have gotten so muddied in the last fifteen years from from you know controlled demolition to there was no plane to the pla you know all the different stories now so it just becomes one of them things where it's it really it really gets yeah there is no truth yeah, there is it, no it, truth it, I mean I've 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 I've, I've come to that that's a saying I kind of come to with a lot of these cases the Frank Matthews all of them sometimes there's when there's when there's so much information, there's no information. Because yeah. think of it this way. If you wanted to hide, so if a piece of information exists, it can never be made to unexist, right? There's some truth. Something happened, right? Yeah, yeah. I can't unkill JSK. But how, so now how do I hide that piece of information? Well, if the more misinformation that exists around it, and the more times you turn on TV and see some crazy person, uh, oh, you can see the face of the devil over the Twin Towers, right? yeah. before, you know, just all these different things. You just tune out after a while, and you say, you know what, let me just go to work and eat my chicken wings and watch football game, and, you know, I'm <laughs> not going to think about it. And I think a lot of that's by design. I think that's a whole other kind of oh, level of social engineering that almost dumbs you down from None. any way thinking about anything, you know, critical. Oh, no, that's, see, that's, you know, that's standard. The CIA developed those, those techniques and other, other, other people. That's absolutely, absolutely done on purpose. Yeah. It's absolutely. They love, they love to have conspiracy theorists and kooks. Oh, because yeah. if a guy, if a guy looks kooky, he might be saying the truth, but because of the way he looks or because he says, and here's a, you know, and here's where you have to be careful and I try to be with my stuff. If you if you say one crazy thing that turns out to be not true, it undermines. You might have yeah. said ninety nine other things that were true, but they're looking for um, um, one thing to undermine you. You know, it's like no, you're on totally. the it's not like you're on the witness stand. If you if they they catch you, oh, you stole. Well, you said you 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 went to the store at seven fifteen, but it was always was it seven thirty? Oh, oh, seven thirty. So oh, you so you're a liar. So everything else you said isn't true. Yeah, you know, and that's you're absolutely true. I mean, especially in this world of information, especially if you're going to spew about it, and it, you, it really is incumbent on the person talking about it to really know what the hell they're talking about. Because, like you said, one chink in your armor, it really kind of undermines the rest, of the rest of the stuff you're talking about. And people do, like you said, uh, kind of tend to tune out. Um, cool, yeah. man. Shit, I could, I could, like I said, bro, we're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna have, I'm gonna have you on again because we didn't get into the uh, police state movie too much, so. Um, we're going to link up again sometime down the road, my friend, and talk about some of your next projects, and that would include Police State. Is that all right with you? Yes, sir. Cool, man. Um, this has been my pleasure, my friend. I thank you so very much for taking the time. Again, this has been Al Prophet, awesome documentary filmmaker slash historian. And, you know, sounds like here, a cool-ass dude, man. Check out his work. Uh, you will not be disappointed, man. This guy is thorough. AlProphet.com. Thanks for having me on. Talk to you later. All right, brother. That's our profit. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been me speaking to you. Stay tuned. Thank you for listening to It's Me Speaking to You. Please spread the word and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And stay tuned for more conversations with a variety of guests on a variety of subjects.